Okay, so good morning. <coughs> uh, I should almost good morning. Okay, good morning again. And I'm supposed to talk about open hardware and Arduino. Uh, so yesterday I prepared my slides uh, with several examples, but I see we're running 15 minutes late. And I would suggest instead of listening to my boring presentation to see a very nice movie about Arduino, which should explain what Arduino is and what the philosophy behind Arduino is. So I propose we, we watch the movie and after that, if you have any questions or comments, I can answer to them. Just a, mm. And by the way, this movie was run in a media lab in Madrid, right? The Arduino documentary. Yeah. 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 
boards and wanted to port uh, a bunch of programs to a cheaper microprocessor, basically, um, to install in some installations. And uh, I helped write like a little compatibility layer so that all the old programs could run on the new processor. And um, then just being a writer and not wanting to spend too much time on my actual thesis, I spent more and more time like working with Masa and the guys developing them. I knew that there was this development of this uh, hardware equivalent to processing. And I went over to uh, Ibrea in June 2005 to do a workshop with them on another subject. And they showed me the Arduino board at that point. And I looked at it and I said, you know, this is great. And it definitely works for your school, works for my school too. But I think it could be a larger thing. And I think more people would want to use this. And Massimo said, oh, that's good feedback. Thanks. And then I went back to the States, and uh, a couple weeks later they wrote to me and said, you know, you, we, we, we want to go further with this, and we want to try and get to the larger world. Do you want to join us as part of the team? And I said, yeah. And it was just, for me, it was a case that this is a tool that I could see using myself, and therefore I could believe in actually helping to get out to a wider world. After the first prototyping, uh, there was the meeting uh, or the desire to start manufacturing something in a more professional way and in a more uh, commercial way because all the first sample was and, and mounted was uh, doing just to make uh, to let them work after massimo and uh, david decided and understood the prototype was working they needed to make a bigger batch so we decided to work on uh, 200 units and um, we made, I made a little redesign, a little design for manufacturing in order to produce them. It was a, it was a test. <coughs> they, they agreed with their school, an interaction with an institute uh, and the K3 of Malmo, to buy 50 each. That was uh, a good starting point. Uh, the, that means we will not lose all the money, <laughs> but at least half was uh, coming back. The selling price was, was exactly what we paid for. I think we earned uh, one euro for each board, that is nothing considering uh, all the effort uh, we, put, uh, we put inside. And, um, but uh, after some advertisement, after some uh, speaking with, friend, uh, with friends, uh, this, start, this movement started to move. And so we received the first call of first customer asking for one board. Uh, there was a friend of Massimo and David, but it was the beginning of something. A few months after meeting, he said, hey, Nate, Sparkfun, you guys should carry this thing called Arduino. And I looked at it, and at that time, it was the through-hole version, the RS-232 version. And I said, this looks very, very interesting, uh, but I didn't really understand it. Uh, and I hadn't wrapped my head around it, and so we said, you know, Tom, I don't think it's for us. We don't really do kits. We're not sure how people are going to react to this, and so uh, I decided against it. It was a few months later, six, seven months later, that Arduino came out with the full USB version and fully assembled and tested and ready to go. And Tom, again, came to us and said, hey, Sparkman, you can really carry this. And I said, oh, well, okay, well, I'm not really sure. You know, we'll bring in 20 and see how they sell. And that was the first 20 out of about 40,000 at this point.
desde entonces, eh, bueno, pues también eh, a través de, de Gustavo y, y de seguir en contacto con David, pues eh, organizamos un taller de Arduino en octubre de 2005, que creo que fue uno de los primeros talleres, uno de los primeros talleres que se organizó eh, de Arduino. El último día David propuso eh, eh, hacer pequeños prototipos, eh, se llamaba Retus, Cajar los Viejos y hagamos algo con ellos. Y ahí surgieron proyectos que fueron muy interesantes, pero la gente continuó eh, haciendo pequeños instrumentos electrónicos, haciendo sí. robots. Sí. Sí. So you get print, and then this machine will make it for you. So 
It'll make one or a hundred or a thousand of them if you want. And uh, which is great because there's all sorts of cool open source things that this will make for you. So you don't need to have a laser cutter or a PCB fabrication thing to really participate in open source hardware. You can just design something, this will sit on your desk and print you out stuff. So it's one of the things I really like about this is that this allows you to apply the idea of open source hardware to things that are very, very basic that you would not otherwise consider to be open source hardware. So we have that there's an open source whistle, for example. Uh, there's an open source bottle opener. Uh, over here on the wall, we have um, right here, there's an open source coat hook. So we have a code book. This is open source hardware. There's a file on the internet you can download. And if you have a 3D printer, you can print out as many code hooks as you want. And you don't have, you don't have to pay anybody anything. If you want a bigger code hook, you can make it bigger. Um, and it's just this wonderful idea that we can apply this idea of open source to all of these common everyday things that we use in our life. Like what we're trying to do is open source everything would sort of kind of been a crazy idea 10 years ago, are now actually there's a, a path that we can take to get there. And people are starting to take it seriously. Uh, open source hardware is a fantastic way to make sure other people can see your design and improve them. Open source hardware is a fantastic way. You don't have to answer emails. People asking, can they necessarily use something? You put the license out there and you say, open source hardware for us means you can take our stuff, you can do whatever you want with it. You just have to do the same thing we did. Release it back, allow other people to do whatever they want with it, and they can sell it as long as all the attribution, all the credits, all the things that you've requested are respected. And so far it's worked out great. You look at Linux, it's a perfect example. You look at Apache, uh, you know, all these things that run the web, it's all open source. You have to pay someone or talk to someone or license something. Every time you wanted to put up a website, we wouldn't have the fantastic world of information sharing we do. So I look at Arduino as a physical representation of all the great things we got with open source software, but now it's starting out with hardware. We will get uh, a level where people will be creating people will be creating hardware in the same way that people were creating books after movable type became cheap and easy to replicate. And I really think that that's the level of the open source hardware revolution. So we are looking at something like a Hindenburg event where movable type will change how people read, write, and share information. And only in this case, it will be how we create and use physical objects. The idea behind um, having control over these physical objects and being able to manipulate them at will and not be afraid to take them apart, to see what's inside, to really know everything that's going on. Um, that's something really behind it in search hardware for me and uh, something I'm really passionate about. You know, of course, open source means that you're making it for the community at large based on work that other people have done. So it's kind of like I'm, I'm taking one step up a, up a ladder and then I'm helping other people go further up the ladder. El problema que hay es que por culpa de la sanitación y por culpa del sistema de paneles se cerraba la posibilidad para mucha gente de aprender cómo funcionaban las cosas y que la hora se a un grupo de gente que, que son los hackers, que, que no manejan los límites técnicos, podían, o sea, tenían la capacidad de abrir el elemento de esto a mí que tenía que ser que había dentro. Y bueno, a mí el, el hardware abierto significa volver a tener la posibilidad de mirar qué hay dentro de las cosas, pero hacerlo de una forma que esté permitido, o sea, que sea éticamente correcto, que sea legal y que permita mejorar la educación. Entonces, para mí, el hardware abierto realmente es un sistema que permite a la gente educarse en cómo funcionan las cosas. Cuando vivimos en un mundo en el que hay más ordenadores que los años, pues, tenemos que comprender cómo funcionan las cosas. Ya no para poder prepararlas, sino suficiente para comprender cómo funciona nuestra vida. Y yo creo que es una necesidad. Al principio, la de. ¿Sabes? La pregunta de open source hardware versus open hardware, open source. Pero es still very very complex, it's a very complex situation. There's still not very defined standards or licenses or processes. For us at the beginning, it was a specific need. We knew the school was closing, and we were afraid that uh, lawyers would show up one day and say, everything here goes into a box, 
and gets forgotten about. So we thought, okay, if we open everything about this, then we can, we can survive the closing of the school. So that was the first step. That was able to figure out that there was a way to get a very nice ecosystem of people participating and making extensions, making derivatives and helping. And then our activity of talking to manufacturers and making them to build things became an interesting study on how there could be a business model that would apply to open source. Y para nosotros fue muy importante, ¿no? Como un espacio cultural, ¿no? De experimentación, eh, intentar aplicar también esas lógicas de las herramientas libres a los procesos de trabajo. Y eso fue también la, la idea de, de interactivo, un espacio donde la gente pudiera desarrollar sus propios proyectos, pero que también hubiera gente que se pudiera involucrar como colaborador con sus proyectos también, para la gente de la vida.
the type of creative community that can engender in young people to me, I think that that is, that's going to change everything. And I'm um, really excited to see what happens as it develops. <coughs> Ahora mismo a que tienen 120.000 usuarios o 120.000 usuarios o bueno, cuánto lo han visto por, por circuitos vendidos. Bien, el, el tráfico que estamos registrando en nuestra página web que es de 15 millones de hits a, al mes que se traduce unos 600.000 eh, hits al día. Esto es sabiendo que se emplea activamente en universidades, que se emplea en universidades personales y demás. Imaginemos que de repente se puede emplear Stato chiamato perché è stato Arduino o Fibre? Arduino è il nome di Fibre. Ah, ok, ok, ok. Ah, ok. Ok, ok. Ok, ok. Ok, ok. I definitely see Arduino taking one path of just being very easy to use, even easier than it is now. So making it easier for beginners to get into it. One of my favorite distortion pedals, a big moth, with my favorite microcontroller board, an Arduino. <laughs> Si esta gente de repente empezara a compartir sus ficheros en la, en la red, todo esto, todo esto no podría ser soportado. No, no, no funciona. Uh, 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 um, get an understanding of how a computer works from. Uh, but uh, I can't. And so that's part of my mind. For that, this is the first time we've been doing this. For that, it's the first time we've been doing this. 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 Okay, great. <clears throat> so just a few comments. The first is that the documentary was a uh, it's dated 2010, so the numbers they're giving, I think you should multiply by, say, 10. So it's really incredibly popular. Second is that Arduino, uh, being open, of course, can be um, produced in many different countries. So if you come from India, you're not going to buy Arduino from the US or from Europe, but there's people producing Arduino in India itself. So I think that's interesting as well. And the third is that while I was preparing my slides yesterday, I was looking for different Arduino compatible boards. Say, I, I have three here, which I can pass around. This is like the original Arduino, which has a map of Italy on the back. And there's a company in Hong Kong that developed a modified version. They wanted to have a battery on the board. So they simply modified the design to have a battery on the board. And a colleague of ours from Japan decided he wanted to have a wireless connection on the board itself. So he installed a, a wireless chip and you know, an antenna uh, plug here. But those are only three boards. So I looked on Wikipedia yesterday how many boards are available. And it should be this link. And I was kind of shocked because those are the original Arduino boards and you already see like 10 or something like that. But when you go down you have the old version and here you have Arduino compatible boards. 
and the list is really long. So there is, I would say, hundreds of them available. Those are special purpose Arduino compatible boards, and there again you have many. And this is the one they were talking about called Tiny Lily. I think Gaia experimented with, with them. It's the one that you can use. Um, it's really small and it's really thin, so you can put it on, on, on clothes if you want to have some electronics, some sensors. And there you go, the list is, is really long. Okay, I think that's all for the Arduino introduction.